Good afternoon to all our viewers. Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Samantha Castle and I serve as the Senior Manager for Alumni Relations at the University of Pretoria. Today we focus on another important discussion in the LEAD UP Alumni Thought Leadership Series. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a negative effect on food security and nutrition, particularly on the African continent. With the African context in mind, we felt it was vital to host a discussion on food security. We invite you to listen to experts from the University of Pretoria, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the African Union Development Agency, as they deliberate on the challenges related to food security and how legislatures have responded. This discussion will be moderated by Professor Baran Erasmus, who is our Dean in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. But before we start the discussion, allow me to introduce our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, to say a few words of welcome to you, our viewers. Prof Kupe, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Castle. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, discussion, which is very timely in the context of COVID but more broadly because food security is not something that was, oh, challenges with food security are not issues that we have got about by COVID-19. We have always lived with them. It's also very timely that we have this discussion because it comes on the back of us receiving confirmation last week that we have received a grant we applied for for two million pounds for a food security research network which is um, and we will do in partnership with Leeds University and we will also do it with in partnership FANAPAN, a policy analysis network. This is the best way to do this kind of research. Transdisciplinary teams focusing on a complex problem that is an impact on the attainment of uh, the sustainable development goals. The research that will be done out of this project will be evidence-based policy inputs into policy making. And that is what is Investor Pretoria, we pride ourselves in. We hope that alumni, associates and friends and the general public are here today. Also, on the panel today, you will see uh, the Professor Vini Naido. He comes from our Faculty of Veterinary Sciences, the only Faculty of Veterinary Sciences in South Africa and in much of uh, Southern Africa. Faculty of Veterinary Sciences also turned 100 years uh, this year, so it's their, their centenary. So a wonderful achievement in that regard. I would uh, uh, also like to invite you to future events of this kind. We're running a series. So next week, as you know, on the 24th of June, the Minister of Finance will present an adjustment budget given the impact of COVID. So on the 23rd, at 1800 hours, we'll have a pre budget discussion with the experts, and after the budget is presented, a post budget uh, discussion on the 24th. Otherwise, um, let's start on the debate. Happy you are here. Happy to tell you we're doing a lot of good work at the University of Pretoria. Online teaching and learning is going very, very well. Now, over to our experts. Thank you, Prof. Kupe. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, this event is but one event in a series of panel discussions where alumni and other stakeholders will gather virtually and engage in robust discussions about the future of South Africa and Africa as a whole. Our next event, as Prof Kupi mentioned earlier, will be the pre-budget discussion focusing on the Minister of Finance's special budget adjustment. With that being said, we hope you enjoyed today's discussion and welcome your feedback. Don't forget to drop us a comments and questions in the live feed. Thank you for listening. And over to you, Prof. Erasmus. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Castle. So just for the record, I'm also an alumnus of the University of Pretoria and uh, proud, proud to be here. So uh, welcome to the LEAD UP Alumni Thought Leadership Series. series. The uh, tagline for today's event is COVID-19 implications for food security in Africa. Today's discussion will be led by four experts and we will unpack the challenges related to food security, how legislators have responded and how the pandemic has affected crop yields across the continent. By the end of this session, 
you will gain an understanding of the challenges faced by food systems in Africa and COVID. The uh, CAADP biennial review and how political leaders can use it to guide policy reforms in the context of agriculture. Our legislators have responded to the effects of the pandemic and some of the strategies that can be implemented to mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on food security. This event is brought to you as part of by the University of Pretoria and some of the panelists will be uh, will be joining us are UP academics. The University of Pretoria is one of the largest contact and residential universities in South Africa with its administrative offices on the Hatfield campus in, in the city of Chane in South Africa. This 112 year old institution is also the largest producer of research in South Africa. UP is ranked among the top 100 universities worldwide in three fields of study, veterinary science, that we've already heard about, is having their 100 year anniversary, theology and law, and it is also in the, among the top 1% in eight fields of study, agricultural sciences, clinical medicine, engineering, ecology, immunology, microbiology, plant and animal sciences, and finally, social sciences. UP is building considerable capacities in anticipation of the fourth industrial revolution by preparing students for the world beyond university and offering work readiness and entrepreneurship training. Let me introduce you to our speakers. All of our guests are experts in their respective fields, with a few being UP alumni and academics, and I'm sure they'll undoubtedly offer insight into the topics discussed today. Without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Khaled Al Tawil. He's the program officer at the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Dr. Clement Ajororo, head of the Agriculture Unit at the African Union Development Agency. Professor Cheryl Hendricks, a professor of food security and also the head of the Department of Agricultural Economics, Extension and Rural Development at the University of Pretoria. Last but not least, Professor Vinny Naidu, Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Science at the University of Pretoria. Our process today, in addition to our moderated panels and the, and the questions and answers, we'll be using the Slido platform. Please use the, um, please use the, uh, the entry access code, hashtag leadup 17th of June. And the Slido platform is what we'll use to, to get your questions and that we can then send to the panel. Uh, on the slider platform, there will also be a poll. And this poll we will also use to uh, to generate some of our questions. <clears throat> Moving on to our poll one, if you have a look, our poll one got some questions there. Which topic would you most likely to learn about? Some food security, crop productivity, agriculture, food security policies, or none of the above. And of course, you're welcome to add any other questions you would like. So as we um, dive into the first um, moderated panel session. Um, please uh, go to the Slido platform with that uh, event code, hashtag leadup 17th of June, and give us your comments. Let's move on to, um, to our panel session. I'm going to give a short opportunity for each of our panel members for, for some short opening remarks, and then we move into some more specific questions. Let's start with you, uh, uh, Dr. El Tawil. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Erasmus. It's a great pleasure to be back to the University of Pretoria. I am I am proudly one of the alumni. I did my uh, PhD at the University of Pretoria in law. Uh, currently, I'm working for the Food and Agriculture Organization, but uh, just to clarify that uh, all the views are not necessarily representing any organization. So just a clear uh, disclaimer in the beginning. Thank you, thank you so much also uh, to the University of Pretoria for organizing this very timely uh, webinar on a very important topic, which is the implications of COVID-19 on food security. It is very important to be, uh, to be conscious of the impacts of COVID-19 on food security while the world is dealing with a very serious threat uh, to health. It is very uh, important to avoid turning this health crisis into a food security crisis. Because especially in Africa, with, with the level of development, with, the, with some of the challenges that we are facing now, facing two crises at the same time might, might be very challenging for us. So uh, let me just give some a quick introduction to this topic. Uh, first of all, we need to know that the situation of food security in Africa and all over the world was not very positive even before COVID-19. Since 2017, the number of hunger was increasing in almost all regions in the world. This was mainly driven by conflicts and the climate change. 
So after a decade of improvement, after a decade of steady improvement leading to the realization of uh, sustainable development goal two, which is eradication of hunger, the world is facing a crisis uh, because the number is increasing and the, some of this increase is happening in Africa. So out of the 821 million uh, hunger, uh, number of hunger in the world, in Africa we have almost 239 suffering from hunger. 20% of the population is suffering from uh, one level of hunger in addition to other forms of malnutrition. When COVID-19 uh, uh, strikes a continent, the impacts were even more severe because we have uh, some vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities, I could summarize in, in a couple of points. One, uh, we have a high economic, we, we have a high uh, population growth. We have high demand. Uh, uh, to uh, external imports, we are more dependent on the external wallet to feed African population. Uh, the, our internal African trade in agriculture is very low, and uh, we we are subject to external shocks because of some of the restrictions that many countries have introduced following COVID-19. So the impact of, in Africa w is different because of these vulnerabilities. We need also to be conscious that the continent is not facing one crisis at the moment. We are facing also in Eastern Africa a very severe locust crisis, which is affecting food security. In Southern Africa, we are facing a, a drought for the last three, four years, which affected our yields of production. So the combined effect of this crisis, in addition to uh, some, uh, some constraints when it comes to economic space, has led to major impact on African continents. So the, the, the last point I wanted to put in my introduction is that this crisis is different. It is not the same like the 2007-2008 food crisis because it is affecting both the supply and the demand sides. The supply side, the productivity, the production is affected because we, we have many restrictions on the movement of labor. This is leading to lower productivity. Uh, on the other, and we are, we are also having less access to uh, seeds, to machinery, to all fertilizers that we need for, produ for production. From the other side, from the demand side, the restrictions of movement and the, the lower demand for uh, African exports has led to uh, fewer economic opportunities lower economic growth, which is also affecting the individual demand and the ability to purchase. This is that combined effect of the supply and the demand side is leading, could lead to a, a severe uh, food security crisis unless we have the right policies in place. And I would, I would be glad to come to this point later on during the discussion. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tawil. Um, let's uh, ask Dr. Chairman Ajadolo for his inputs for uh, opening remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I would also like to recognize the uh, fellow panelists uh, for sharing this stage to discuss about uh, food uh, security and the impact that the COVID pandemic is having on the continent. So my name is Clement Ajalolo, and uh, I'm an alumni of the University of Barcelona, Natal, uh, where I also been involved in the food security uh, issues for quite some time. Uh, I, I work with the NEPAD, which is the African Union Development Agency. I'm currently the head of agriculture. So it is very right that uh, I am presented on this platform to discuss food security issues. At NEPAD, uh, as you all know, NEPAD was uh, have been very instrumental in the establishment and the operationalization of the CADEP uh, process that uh, started back in, with the Maputo Declaration in 2003. And after 10 years of progress in Malabo 2014, uh, the head of state and government of Africa uh, evaluated the progress that they have made and felt the need to really accelerate uh, CADEP to produce uh, results. And one of the result areas is also to achieve food security uh, of, across the continent of Africa. So with COVID, we are facing a very big challenge. My colleague uh, Khalid have just given us a very comprehensive background 
uh, on the food security issues and the, some of the factors that need to be looked at. I would well, want to dwell more on the impact that COVID is having and how uh, leadership at the continental level and the regional level is responding to the COVID crisis. So as you will recall, uh, on the 16th of April, the African Ministers of Agriculture, the FAO, and the African Union Development Agency, including the, the Commission, had a high-level panel to discuss the impact of COVID being a health crisis that will spill over to become uh, a food crisis. Uh, as you all know, with the pandemic, many governments and states, territories have shut down. And that shutdown has had enormous impact on the movement of people, including uh, cross-border trade. In Africa, we have, have over 70% of people who trade across the borders are women. And when women are, do not have uh, access to pro provide or bring in income, the entire family or community suffers because they, they hold family structures. In, you know. So going forward, the covert impact really call for us to be able to generate data and also provide insight that will help policy making during this time. Leadership is really required at this point to really negotiate that the full movement of people and the freight corridors are open for essential goods to be, be able to be distributed. So these are some of the things that I would like to highlight as how in, uh, COVID is really impacting on the life and the livelihoods. As we all know, the impact that it has had is already on human, the human impact is already immeasurable, but we cannot afford to have it spill over to the point that the, 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 the food crisis outweigh even the health crisis. And therefore, as we deliberate uh, this afternoon on some of the challenges and the strategies that are being put in place, I will come back later on to dwell more into how the African Union uh, and other Af uh, institutions are playing a critical role in tackling the pandemic. But before we go there, I would also like to put a disclaimer that the views that I was expressed here are not that of my uh, the African Union Development Agency or the African Union, so we treat it as a, a discussion among peers. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, let's move on to Professor Vinny Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invite. Also to mention that I'm a proud alumnus of the university. I specialized in veterinary pharmacology at the university and uh, a specialist in drug development. Uh, on the subject, I have to echo the sentiments of my fellow panelists. The COVID has definitely had an impact on animal production. And when you look at animal production, this is the production of high quality protein. So it's milk, eggs and meat. And the three key sectors here, which have all been affected, you have commercial agriculture, which is your large scale farms, dairies, uh, feeder operations, flocks. And those are the organizations that supply your supermarkets and restaurants. And they are definitely seeing a supply uh, demand issue, but they're also having a problem with labor and getting enough labor. People coming in are not getting jobs because they're not allowed to travel. And you also have issues with social distancing in the workplace. Then the next one, which is the African wildlife. Now, in certain countries like South Africa, we have a very well-established wildlife ranching system. And this system is developed by uh, or supported by tourists and hunting. But it also provides significant amount of meat into the market. Wildlife ranching South Africa estimates that about 20% of meat comes from the wildlife industry. And as this industry is struggling because people can't move, you have less food available, but you also have the negative impact of these farms now facing poaching because people can't afford food. And in some communities, wildlife meat is 40 to 70% of their diet in terms of meat. The last as aspect is the informal trade. Now, informal markets are supported by your small scale farmers. As an example, South Africa has probably 180,000 of these farmers. These could be small herds, or it could be communities where they have one or two animals 
and together you have a herd of about 10,000 animals in the community. These uh, industries are what are most affected because they don't have access to markets. They can't sell their products and there's minimal family income. But you also have other impacts such as absence of veterinary services from the state in these areas because there's just no ability to get people out during the lockdown. So all in all, animal production in Africa faces a number of challenges. I mean, we mentioned drought already, availability of food. We have diseases like South Africa just came out of a foot and mouth uh, quarantine period. Now this just adds on it and it puts a burden on the system and you will definitely see a decrease in productivity. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Professor Naidu. And uh, last but not least, Professor Hendricks. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, as we know, the novel coronavirus is unique in its own way in that we don't know too much about it. But it's not only a health crisis that we're facing, we're also facing a humanitarian crisis. So we know that Africa has been fairly resilient in the past, having dealt with many crises and particularly food security crises. But as mentioned already, most of these were due to agriculturally linked shocks. And so households have been fairly resilient and learning over the centuries as to how to deal with these particular um, crises. So this affects food distribution and also the availability of food and primarily link, uh, limited to the rural population. But the world we face today is quite different. Population sizes and also population densities, particularly in cities, pose a significantly different challenge to that of previous food security crises in Africa. So the 2007-2008 high food price crisis was the first that affected primarily urban but also rural communities on a large scale. It showed us how intricately linked the food system was across the world. So initially it was anticipated that that global food crisis would not really affect Africa's deepest rural populations, but this was not so. So its effect was felt both by producers and also by consumers. But as we try to anticipate the impact of the COVID um, crisis, we are stretched beyond our ability to rely on those past um, incidences because we're facing um, a health, food system and humanitarian crisis all rolled in one. And this is really going to stretch us as academics, as governments trying to decide on what policies to implement, as well as the entire UN system. It's going to challenge us to think and act in far more cross-sectorally um, fashioned responses. And this as we try quickly to sa save lives and then in the long run to try and minimize the losses to the development gains, particularly in Africa. So we need to try and look at this from the economic and social perspective, but also at the different levels from the individual to the household community level and then also at the national and regional levels. So how Africa responds to this crisis is going to shape our future. And so we have to think very quickly and very smartly across the different um, available options as to what the best outcome could be for the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Professor Hendricks. Um, it's uh, Professor Altawil, the, uh, or Dr. Altawil, apologies. The, um, there's a, a emerging theme here that this uh, COVID-19 crisis is on top of a whole lot of pre-existing existing vulnerabilities in the continent, which then provides um, quite, quite a bit of um, challenges to, to make sense of it. So what, what, um, what opportunities and, and what guidance material exists to um, political leaders to enact policy reforms uh, for agriculture that, that actually speaks to these multi multitude of drivers and multitude of vulnerabilities. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I um, it's, it's a very good question and I think uh, Clement already uh, alluded to some of the answers related to how the African continent is responding. In fact, actually, um, uh, the African Union has responded very quickly in April. As Clement has said, we had this joint meeting uh, and very important declaration. I think one important uh, uh, provision in this declaration was calling for keeping the food systems alive. The food systems in Africa, the regional food system should be kept open and functioning. Because if, the, if we have a destruction of the food systems, the impact on food security will be so severe. So as you said, we are having these uh, fundamental challenges in the African, uh, in the African continent. But the crisis could be a wake-up call 
for us to have some necessary uh, overdue reforms in Africa. And I, I believe that we have already the CADEP, which provides us with the policy framework on how uh, African agricultural uh, policy should be formulated. Uh, we, the CADEP is, uh, is, is, was a long time uh, uh, formulated and we have uh, some important objectives. One of them is to have a 6% gross in the agricultural sector and that government dedicate at least 10% of their budget to agriculture. I, I don't think that many African countries are doing so at the moment. We have an increasing number of countries who are adhering to CADEP. But maybe we need to take this very seriously at the moment because with the dis disruption in the food supply chains uh, and the trade the supply chains, we might be very vulnerable to any external shocks. So it is, it, it is an opportunity to localize our production, our agricultural production, and have a regional approach to this. In the SADC region, in, 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 within the African continental free trade area that was launched and should be effective soon, it is a huge opportunity for us to increase our intra-agricultural trade in general. We have a commitment. I think we have a very ambitious objective of reaching 50% intra-African trade by 2050. The numbers now are less than 20%. But in order to do this, we have to, do, to, to deal with the important bottlenecks. One of them is the cost of intra-African trade. The cost of intra-African trade is one of the highest in the world. Sometimes it's almost 50% of the cost of the final product is, is, is lost in the, in the transportation because of the borders, because of uh, trade facilitation issues. Now, under the World Trade Organization, we have the Trade Facilitation Agreement, which calls for removing some of the red tape and some of the unnecessary uh, bureaucratic measures. And we need to take this seriously now because reducing this red tape and uh, decreasing all the uh, unnecessary constraints on trade could decrease the cost of trading by 10%. And the, this is a, a study according to uh, the World Bank. If you, if you decrease the cost of, of, uh, of export, intra-African trade by 10%, you are mitigating to a certain extent the, the increase in the cost of production as, as a result of COVID-19. So it, it is a wake-up call. We need, I think we need to look at this crisis as an opportunity and, and on how to be more prepared for the future. Regional integration is key now. It is not just uh, a political um, objective. It is economic objective that we need really to adhere to. Taking, uh, taking opportunity of this, um, uh, of, of this question, I would like also to, to comment on one of the questions that was uh, related to how food security, how to deal with food security and hunger, uh, and especially in South Africa. But I think all over the world, one of the very important measures that some countries are taking is to ensure cash transfers, social uh, security, a smart social security system that targets the most vulnerable because you cannot afford to, to be in hunger for a few days. So uh, developing our social security systems and making sure that we are targeting the most vulnerable is very key at the moment in order to avoid a hunger crisis in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, just a quick, quick follow-on to Professor Hendricks. Um, if, if these are the, the, the responses that are available to political uh, leaders and, and around policy reforms, how do you see the options for legislators in Africa to respond to these effects? So we need to think cleverly and smartly. So fortunately, Africa has made a number of gains, but some of them are under threat through the new responses. So for example, the, in Africa, school feeding programs have been rolled out um, at quite a large scale over the last 10 years and have been reaching the poorest um, children in order to protect their development and their future human capacity. But with lockdowns and school closures, these kind of responses are not readily available. And we can see it in our own country that um, governments are struggling to see how they can repurpose school feeding programs in order to provide that essential food. For many children, those school feeding programs are the only meal that children receive in a day. So what's really required is a cross-sectoral look and a very multidisciplinary approach into what the likely impacts and also the, um, the, the um, 
other components that could respond to that. So you fix one part of the system and you see other problems emerging. So you need a team that can think multi-sectorally to, to do that. So if we distribute free food, there's lots of evidence that, um, that can affect livelihoods in, in communities. But at this stage, it's critical to get that food to people. So there will be trade-offs that are needed and these need to be very carefully considered. One of the major threats that's possible um, in this time, um, and with South Africa's budget speech coming up next week, that we have to think about is how much of the gains in agricultural spending and the budget for agriculture might be redirected into health. So in the, in the late 80s, early 90s with the HIV pandemic, we saw a lot of agricultural resources being diverted into the health sector. And the, the immediate need for the health response is something that can do that. We can see that in the international community, much of food aid could also be redirected into um, providing vaccines and the health responses. So we need to think very quickly of how do we meet the immediate humanitarian needs without compromising the long-term development needs. But of course, there are also gains to be had. So more health system digitization means agriculture could piggyback on that and reach more people. Um, and so there, there are opportunities um, for agriculture if we can think cleverly how to get a win-win rather than a very negative trade-off in the situation. Thank you very much, Paul Hendricks. Let's um, move over to some of our poll results and, and, and get some of the questions that's uh, coming in on our Slido platform. So the poll results is around which um, which topic would you most like to learn about? So 52% of our um, audience would like to know more about food security, 11% around crop productivity, 19% around agriculture, 26% around food security policies, and all of the above 44. I think let's take that food security theme a little bit further. And there was a question coming in here around the um, uh, short-term COVID-19 responses and, and longer-term food security. So I'd like to ask the panel, do you, do you think that the focus on, on short-term responses, such as food parcels and, and, and others, will have a longer-term impact on food security? Um, perhaps uh, let's start there with uh, Dr. Ajorlolo and then see what if any of the other panel members have got anything to contribute. Thank you very much. Uh, so short-term solutions, food parcels are making a significant contribution to keeping people going alive in the short term. Uh, it is cannot be start and end with the current food parcels. We need to think and be ahead of the crisis. So as we distribute the uh, food parcels to keep people, feed people, we must have a plan on taking the population and livelihood post the pandemic. So in my view, uh, the short term intervention of food parcels are necessary. We cannot uh, argue how important it is that when people are hungry, there are so many other health and social ills that follow uh, hungry stomach. So it is very important that uh, the short-term interventions are in place, but uh, leadership must also have a plan in taking, uh, tackling the pandemic post the the, the, the current situation we're facing. Thank you very much. Uh, any, any other panel member to to contribute to comment there? Yes, Baron, yeah. I would. Okay, carry on. Oh, <laughs> so, so, the distribution of parcels is extremely important for short-term nutrition. But the question I have is, what is the negative impact this has had on certain food producers? As an example, where are these parcels coming from? Are they favoring certain producers? Now, there's some... Um, understanding that this comes from your organized industries, like your big supermarket chains. The small scale farmers are not providing into the system. So in fact, by distributing food, you're favoring only one part of the production system. And the persons who need to sell their products the most are being disadvantaged. So the system needs to be designed in a way that everybody who supplies in the system benefits from the sharing of parcels in terms of who supplies. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with produce on farms that are now gonna be destroyed because they're not entering into the market. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, may, maybe may I come here? Uh, I think the, the two interventions, short and long term, are not mutually exclusive. 
a government should follow the two approaches because the short-term approach is necessary. You are just uh, dealing with a fire. Uh, people are not having access to food, so you have to feed them. And in order to feed them, you, you, you need to have cash transfer, food parcels. And But I agree also with what Dr. Naidu said about how the system is working. I, I, I'm sure in Africa we have a lot of uh, space for improvement, especially if we can procure food from smallholders, uh, family farmers who are the most affected by the crisis. But in the long term, it, it, the key word is, here is resilience. How do you invest now in transforming the agricultural system to make them more resilient? This can happen through different, different uh, policy options. One of them is to ensure technology transfer, access to financing. There's a lot of measures that the government can intervene on this. Uh, how that, the amount of budget that dedicated to the agricultural sector, how to increase this, how to recognize the importance of food security. Uh, also, I think there's one, one issue that was mentioned as part of the questions here about the link between different issues like food security, infrastructure, and water. And, uh, and it's true uh, that when we deal with food security, you should not take it in isolation. Having good infrastructure system support food security. One of the studies uh, estimated that when you invest $1 in, uh, in nutrition, the return on investment is $16 because you are avoiding the health consequences of malnutrition and at the same time supporting children to go to schools, having more job opportunities so the multiplier effect is very important. And I think this is important for policymakers to take into consideration. Investing in food security and nutrition avoids a lot of losses that is going in the, in the health sector because of missed opportunity for better nutrition, especially at early age of development during the 1,000 days, the first 1,000 days of, of, uh, of life, which are very critical uh, 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 lifetime. If you miss the opportunity to, to provide the child with all his nutritional needs, you might deal with long-term consequences with so much financial impacts. Thank you. But you can also link those food parcels conditionally to the provision of primary health care, because that's one of the things we see as being neglected, children's vaccinations, primary health care visits, um, chronic health um, uh, treatment. And so if you link it carefully, you can do two things at the same time, make sure that people's nutritional needs are met, particularly for children, a small gap in their nutritional provision can have a long-term lifetime effect. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Prof. Hendricks. Colleagues, the, um, the, our second poll has just gone live, and while you respond to that on the um, Slido platform, let's uh, delve into, in, into our, a, few, a few other questions again. Um, first question, I'd like to follow up on this idea of, of impacts on different scales, um, either on different spatial scales and impacts in a different uh, short-term and, and, and long-term consequences. Uh, Professor Hendricks, uh, what do you think are the likely consequences of, of, of these of hunger, of food insecurity and malnutrition, not just on, on the people in the communities, but also on the economies of, of individual African nations? Okay, so human productivity starts with individuals. Um, and as I've mentioned, nutrition is critical to ensure human productivity. Uh, and if we see a gap in that, we lose productivity in future. Africa at the at the moment when the crisis is starting to emerge um, is at a, at harvest time, so we don't really know what the impact of constrained agricultural activities, as constrained access to inputs, is going to do um, in the few, in the next cycle of our agricultural system. But being productive and being healthy is critical um, for communities to be able to carry out their livelihoods and to lead productive lives. So any losses now will be losses for the future. And we know that we're starting off with a poor base um, in that at least 25% of Africa's population are affected by chronic malnutrition when they are children. Um, and so if we are to face a food crisis, that could really have a double blow for the health implications of COVID. Thanks, Dr. Hendrick. Just a quick, quick follow-up there. It's, it's um, in these... Implement, in implementing lockdown regulations, which obviously affects the, the, the movement and activities of individual people, it seems that, that um, many African countries didn't quite 
did, didn't have comprehensive plans on how those could uh, th those who could no longer work under lockdown would feed themselves, and also perhaps not a full understanding of the long-term consequences that you just mentioned of this mm -hmm. lockdown. But what could political leaders have done differently? That's why it's a critically important for a government to have a disaster response mechanism that is linked into a food security and nutrition coordination com um, committee or a group that is very centrally managed um, in order to gain access to policymakers and to provide the sound evidence um, on the ground as well as from scientific uh, reviews as to what those likely effects could be. And this is critical to be able to trade or to look at the trade-offs that um, that governments could be facing. Um, so if governments had sound comprehensive food security policies in place at the time that the and that the crisis broke, it would have been much easier to deal with that. For example, South Africa's social protection program was able to be repurposed and scaled up in order to reach the most vulnerable because we knew where they were, we know who they are, and we know what their needs are. But for many African governments, um, these kind of programs are very limited. They're often dependent on external funding from development partners, and there isn't a mechanism to be able to distribute money in particular particular fast um, and nutritious foods. So we want to not just make sure that tummies are filled with, with the main, main staples of the country, but to make sure that the nutritional programs are there. So fortification programs are important, um, food distribution, cold chains to deal with the, the livestock products, for example. So at the moment across the world, some of the most nutritious food is rotting in warehouses because these um, uh, highly perishable f fruits, vegetables, and dairy, dairy and meat products are not able to get to the people who most need them. And even in those situations, um, there isn't often the energy to store those kinds of foods. So there are lots of opportunities that we could be looking at to improve the resilience of our food systems in future. One of those resilience mechanisms is our reliance on, on imported grains that countries really have to look at in terms of how do we um, make sure that our food systems are more resilient in future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's start with that uh, idea of import and export. Um, this is a question to Prof Naidu, but I think uh, Dr. Zalta Wilna Jorola will also have input here. So like how has the pandemic affected the export of food from Afri Africa? So do you, do you think other countries will start moving away from importing food from Africa or, or anywhere else for that matter? Uh, yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing to consider is you need movement to happen to move food across. And this has definitely been hampered. So the ability to get produce across to get your logistics in place has definitely hampered the trade. And then on the other hand is your receiver needs to be able to receive the product, have the disposable income to actually pay for it. So we're actually dealing with a double situation here is you may not be able to move your product, but you also have a country that not may not have the means to pay for it anymore because the amount of income uh, is that is available has decreased. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I think countries may be less inclined to import food because they can produce enough themselves. So that has a net effect. The other impact is countries that are producing too much food, which can't sell them on a different market, may choose to sell them to Africa at a cheaper price. And this then hurts your local economy because your producers can't compete with the subsidized prices they're getting. So yeah, in the long term, I think we're going to see a problem, but there may be benefits as well. So if you look at the current debate between uh, say the EU, the USA and Australia with China on what happened with coronavirus, that they respond in time. China's response is, well, if you don't trust us, we're not going to buy your products. So there is definitely a huge market in China to sell products to. So this is an opportunity for Africa and farmers to step up, to have the right systems in place to actually take advantage of this opportunity. Because China is a huge consumer and we can certainly meet that uh, demand, but we need to have the right systems in place. And that is where we struggle. We don't actually have the necessary disease control, the necessary monitoring programs and identification systems. So a lot of things need to be put in place for us to take advantage of these opportunities as well. Thanks, sir. Professor Nadine. Dr. do you think the, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement um, can be another such mechanism, one that on the one hand uh, becomes a lever for food security in Africa, but on the other hand also speaks to um, mitigating some of the short-term impacts of COVID-19? 
Yes. Um, okay. We were talking, I think all, all of us are talking about the very negative aspect of COVID-19. I, I am trying to focus on what are the opportunities here. And the, when it comes to the opportunities, uh, I think the African continental free trade area is a very important opportunity for Africa. When, when we look at the intra-African trade in exports, we have only 27%. In imports, only 17% are intra-African trade. We are the, trading with the rest of the world much, much more than uh, how we trade with each other. When we look up on what we are exporting to the world, we are exporting mainly cash crops, cacao, nuts, fruits, spices, and flowers. While we are importing very crucial products, uh, uh, cereals, vegetable oil, sugar, meat, and dairy. This is what we are importing. So we are vulnerable. When countries started to lock down their exports, we had one, almost 110 uh, export restriction measures all over the world. This affected food security in Africa. But at the same time, it is, it is a very important opportunity for us to trade more with each other using the continental free trade area. I understand that the continental free trade area launching was postponed for one month. I think we need to speed up the process. We have everything in place now. We need to speed up the process. We need to focus more on food security concerns and, and agricultural exports. And we need to work more on our connectivity. It is not only about removing trade barriers, but it is about making sure that exports can go from one country. I, I am, I'm Egyptian and uh, South Africa. There should be a way to, from all over the way, from Cairo to Cape Town without any constraint, if we are seriously talking about intra-African trade. So just a summary, it is very important opportunity, but it needs to be uh, speeded up in order to make use of this, use it, uh, to make use of this to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, General, um, what, what are your views on, on these trade corridors to, to offset the potential negative impacts of COVID-19? Sure. Uh, the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Agreement is a very uh, is central tool. Uh, at the political level, one would say that it is a very strong signal uh, put up by the African leadership that there is a high level of seriousness about integrating the African region. And integrating politically and economically will be the way that Africa will really be self-sustaining. So the African continental free trade area comes with a, a whole lot of uh, opportunities that uh, can be leveraged to improve the economies as our uh, colleagues have mentioned, uh, we trade less among ourselves. And what the question is, why? Why do we trade so little among ourselves and yet we trade more from outside? There are a number of factors. One, we, do we have the systems in place to be able to uh, facilitate trade? Uh, the in issue of infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure beyond just road network, infrastructure extending to various other factors, the financial system, the, the, the control, the, the, the regulatory. So when we look at the African continental free trade, it is a, a, an instrument that will really help Africans to begin to uh, look into how we are able, able to, be, to trade among ourselves so that we can be able to leverage and also be more resilient. If I, uh, we, we mentioned on, uh, in, the, in the discussion just a while ago that some countries may have uh, excess production, while others may, due to maybe environmental and other uh, uh, challenges, may not be able to produce. If we are able to have a free movement of, uh, of, of goods and commodities within the continent, we are able to move food products freely between the borders and be able to make sure that everybody have access to food. I mentioned earlier in my intervention that a lot of uh, cross-border trade happens in Africa, but these are mainly done and informal. But the African free trade then brings on board that everyone is touched. I think there's some level of perception that this African free trade is that high level political uh, agreement, but I think it's about time that we see it, how it affects the ordinary person who goes, move from Ghana, 
for example, where I come from, and go and buy tomatoes from Burkina Faso and bring it and sell in Ghana. These are real issues. There are a number of red tapes, there are a number of barriers to trade. And these affect ordinary people, not just uh, the big economies. So the free trade area comes with a lot of opportunities. It's not an easy negotiation, as uh, is we know. Uh, we also know that uh, it came into effect uh, operational on the 1st of April. It's supposed to go uh, enforcement on the 1st of July, but now it's been uh, postponed for about a month. But I might want uh, to say here that the leadership uh, is working to really, even within the, uh, the pandemic, to intervene. For example, we are told that there has been a lot of uh, free trade corridors that has been created facilitated by the AFCA so that essential goods can be freely uh, traded. There are also negotiations to put monitoring on some uh, trade tariffs to allow uh, movement of uh, goods uh, across the continent. So these are some of the things that the free trade area brings to us to also improve our capacity to be able to, to, to produce and trade and distribute. Thank you very much. You, you mentioned a lot of the, the, the existing trade happening in an informal manner, but um, that, that by itself poses particular challenges to, to uh, government investment on sanitary disease control and research. Um, Prof. Naidu, uh, already, already the, the investment in COVID-19 and all the regulation, all the responses to it, uh, threatens government's ability to keep these sanitary disease control things in place. And on top of that, if you have a very strong informal uh, trade, that, that poses an additional challenge. How will we cope? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. So uh, going back to the free trade agreement, I mean, free trade is dependent on other factors. And when you're dealing with animal products, diseases travel much faster than anything else. I mean, Obert illustrated that in people, but on the veterinary side, we know this for ages. So governments have to invest in strategies to produce uh, systems that allow for diseases to be managed, quarantine facilities, proper animal identification and treatment systems. And that is just one step to actually allow for safe products. The other aspect we have to deal with in Africa is comes down to treatment. A lot of our medication available is actually counterfeit. Counterfeit medication have problems, they're contaminated, and this further complicates the safety of food. So government needs to set in and put in programs in place to ensure that we're not only producing enough food, but we're producing food that is safe. So food that is free of contaminants, food that is not going to spread a disease and actually co cause a collapse of the agricultural systems across the country. And foot and mouth is one of those diseases. If we don't handle this disease correctly, foot and mouth can collapse an entire country's uh, economy. It spreads quickly. It puts a complete halt on animal production. And other countries then don't want to move products because the disease can travel on other commodities. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And I am worried that by investing more in health, in other words, healthy people, we're actually not focusing on the other aspects, which in the veterinary world we call one health. You need a healthy person, which is dependent on a healthy environment and healthy animals. And all three have to be considered together. Otherwise, you're just going to fail. Treating a disease in a person helps you today. But what do you do once that person recovers? Where's the nutrition going to come from? Where's the healthy system to support them? So there's massive impacts of this. Thank you very much, Prof. Nadi. Um, just going back to our, uh, got some feedback on our second poll, and we've got a very enthusiastic audience, all who would like to know a lot more about food security in Africa. Um, and to to uh, respond to that need, let's have a look at some of the questions coming in on, on Slido. So there's two questions I'd like to put together. Um, first one is, um, what's the panel's perspectives on mechanisms to redirect excess food to the needy? Well, Vendrix mentioned earlier that, that we do have some storage challenges and then linked to that. So what, what can the ordinary man, and man or woman in the street, the everyday citizens do to advocate some of the solutions that, that we've uh, come up with here? So we've got four minutes to go. So let's uh, prop, uh, prop Hendrix. Yeah, sure. It's a very interesting question. Um, one of the um, elements of South Africa's disaster management plan was the opportunity for ordinary citizens to provide responses and to talk directly to government. And it's quite incredible how many fellow citizens took the opportunity to engage in that. And I think we should be doing more of that, taking the opportunity when invited to contribute. 
the uh, other way is, I guess, in all of our lives, making small changes um, and making small contributions to those around us, those we can reach in the in the constrained situation we live in, is important. Or enabling organisations that are able to to reach out to others on our behalf. So solidarity funds, for example, um, and contributing to NGOs who are doing credible work and trying to reach the most needy because that's one of the big challenges to make sure that those resources go to the people who need it the most at, in the most timely way. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Tawil. You've got the last word. Very quick uh, remark here. One of the, the mechanisms that are very successful in the African continent, and I'm here referring to, to Egypt as an example, we have what we call uh, food banks. Food banks are responsible for collecting food, even food that could be go uh, before it is spoiled, they co collecting excess food from even uh, restaurants and hotels, from charities, and redistributing this to the needy. It started at a very small project, but now it reaches millions of, of people in, in, in Egypt, those who don't have really access, real access to, to food. So I think this is also an opportunity for, for uh, uh, developing this concept in order to target the most needy people of food. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Altawil. Uh, any, anything to add, Dr. Uh Not much, but just to say that uh, when it comes to food uh, waste or food that is not in use, uh, it, it, it's food that may not be, but there is economic value to food that is reasonably uh, not in use. So my addition to the, the, the discussion will be that uh, we need uh, the private sector, we need uh, financiers to come on board to facilitate that when food is kept somewhere, it can be facilitated to be distributed to the needy. And that requires collective effort from all sectors to be able to get the food to the needy. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Um, I think that brings us to, to the end of, um, of, of our uh, Q&A session. Let me just quickly see what's coming in on the Q&A line. I think we're also uh, out of time, two minutes to, to, to three. Um, colleagues, I'm going to close the session. I, I thank everyone that has, uh, that has joined us, and I hope this has been informative. Um, thank you for attending. Um, today's event was brought to you by the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Team. And uh, don't forget that we'd like to hear your opinion on the event, whether you found it informative and helpful. So please uh, complete the final poll for the day on, on Slido. Um, also, don't forget that this is uh, one of several events that um, the Alumni Relations team runs. And the next session takes place on Tuesday, 23rd of June from 6 to 7 South African time. And then again on Thursday, 25th of June from 6 to 7 South African time. And these discussions will center on the pre and post budget debate. Um, and the question there is, is the COVID-19 economic stimulus plan enough to reconstruct the economy? So uh, I, I trust you will join us again for these uh, stimulating and invigorating discussions. And uh, in particular, before we close off, thank you very much to our panel members, the insights you've shared with us, and uh, I do hope we'll bump into each other again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.